session meeting today. Today is February 23rd, 2021, if you can believe that. It sounds so um, far out here. 2021, and we'll be, we will begin today with the Pledge of Allegiance led by, I believe, John O'Grady. Is that right, Dean? Yes, sir. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As a reminder, uh, this is a public meeting and is being recorded. We kindly ask that you maintain the same level of decorum as if you were meeting in person. Finally, for those of you calling in, please be in please ensure that you have muted your phone line by pressing star six. Uh, thank you so much. We appreciate your cooperation. Um, as uh, you all know, uh, it's Black History Month and uh, throughout Black History Month, we've had special guests with us to help us celebrate and honor the legacy of African Americans' contribution to this great country. And, um, and so uh, this week, I'm so pleased to uh, present to you. Uh, I'm just going to. Oh, OK. Uh, um, this, this week, we're especially excited to welcome this morning's Black History Month guest, and that's Rita Smith, my very good friend, our, our local historian who uh, we rely on uh, at so many levels and has so much, has captured so much of Central Ohio's history. And uh, I just can't wait to hear what she's presenting today. But she's the founding chair of James Preston Poindexter Foundation and uh, today's Franklin County Historian of the Week. Um, Paul Imhoff, Upper Arlington School Superintendent, Welcome, it's a pleasure to have you join us as well. And Sandra Jamison, a second generation historian and uh, from Second Baptist Church. Um, uh, I understand that you've invited this morning, uh, you've been invited this morning to offer some local history about Pleasant Litchford, the, the Pleasant Litchford family, uh, the family's background and how they settled into Franklin County and the ties of Litchford family as to Upper Arlington community, especially Upper Arlington High School. So we're excited with that. And, and then finally, uh, let me also have um, recognized Toya Williams, who's part of our Franklin County family. Toya is descendant of the Litchford family. So that's exciting. Uh, and will tell us how you're related to Pleasant Litchford and, uh, and introduce the friends that we have this morning. We're really excited to have you all with us and excited to hear about the Pleasant Litchford family. Well, thank you for having us today, Commissioner Brown, Commissioner Boyce, and Commissioner O'Grady, County Administrator Wilson. We're all very excited to be here to share uh, my family's story and the story of Perry Township in Franklin County. So I am related to Pleasant Litchford. Um, he is my great, 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 great grandfather. And I don't know, Dean, if you could share my PowerPoint for me. Thank you. One moment, please. Okay, thank you. Should be good to go, Toya. Okay, do I advance the slides then? Um, I can do it for you. Just let me know when you're ready. Go ahead, um, start with the family tree. Okay, as you can see here, um, this is my family tree, just showing that I am related to Pleasant Litchford. I am a descendant on my grandmother's side, which is my father's mother. So Pleasant Litchford to me, as I said, would be my great, 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 great grandfather. Um, on my father's mother's side, which makes me really happy. I didn't find out this information until my father passed away uh, a couple of years ago, starting doing research and honoring my dad's last wishes. His last wish was to be buried with his mother because she died um, 24 hours after his birth in 1937. So in going to Union Cemetery to honor his wish, I learned that I was related to Pleasant Litchford and then begin uh, to start researching my family. So it's been a wonderful experience so far. And I've been able to meet family that I have never met before. You can go to the next slide. So just to give you a little background on uh, Pleasant Litchford and for this presentation, I'm gonna to refer to him either as Pleasant or my grandfather to make it more personal. So Pleasant Litchford was born into slavery in 1789 on a plantation in Lynchburg, Virginia. 
He was a master blacksmith by trade. And at that time, that was a very much well and in demand trade. He was able to purchase his freedom and the freedom of his family uh, before 1829. So after being free, he migrated from Virginia to Ohio around 1830 with his wife, Catherine, and his four children. My great, 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 uh, my great, 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 had to count grandfather, Blake Litchford, which is his son, um, was the last Litchford child to be born in, on the plantation into slavery. So when he migrated from Virginia to Ohio, he became one of the first settlers in Perry Township, which is, uh, of course, Franklin County, Ohio, now Upper Arlington. From what I've learned, he was a man who really valued family, education, and faith. He was an invaluable community leader who worked along other side African-American leaders such as James Poindexter towards social justice reform education. He was part of the anti-slavery movement also and worked with the Underground Railroad. Um, in 1833, after being in Ohio for a while, um, he started purchasing land, you know, to just he, he wanted to make a better way for himself and his family. So he started purchasing land. And this was despite the Ohio black laws that were enacted to discourage immigration. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Those were the laws requiring a bond of $500 and a sponsorship guaranteeing good behavior and requiring court uh, papers as a proof of a free person. It is stated that William Neal paid his uh, black law bond we we're trying to prove that is what we found in the records, stating that he was a good person of color, a good upstanding person. So even with this, I would say obstacle in his way, he was able to purchase 277 acres of land in Perry Township and became the uh, fourth largest landowner in that area. Next slide. So he was just, you know, my grandfather was instrumental in improving education opportunities for African Americans in the community. He, he was a community leader who valued education. With that in mind, in 1869, he uh, provided land from his own farm to build the first colored school in that area. And if you can see on the map, it's highlighted in red where it shows the Pleasant Litchford and where the colored school was located. And today, that would be where the Upper Arlington Senior Center is now located. Um, also on this land, he built a cemetery for the African-American community so people of color could lay their family to rest, uh, which is a wonderful thing because, you know, at that time, they had nowhere to bury their mem family members. Um, if we had a map today, and I apologize that we don't, it would show that his land stretched from Upper Arlington High School to west of Northland Park and Tremont Elementary. So he owned a quite a, a lot of land in that area. Next slide. Okay, so my grandfather, Pleasant Litchford, he died at the age of 89. And uh, with that being said, he was buried um, on the, in the cemetery in the, you know, on his land that he had uh, created for the African-American community and his descendants. So um, his body remained there until 1955. So there was a few things that happened at that time. So in the 1940s, uh, the city of Upper Arlington annexed that land because after he died, he had parceled it out to his children and descendants. And as time went on, they started selling the land. So in, 1940, in the 1940s, Upper Arlington annexed that land. In 1955, those bodies that were in that cemetery, that half acre cemetery, um, were moved to Union and Greenlawn cemeteries for reinterment because that's when they started to build that high school. Fast forward to uh, 2020 and uh, there are remains with Upper Arlington building a new high school. There were rem some remains that were found, you know, upon an archeological proof they uncovered the remains that were found there. And that was August of last year. So with that being said, um, I know that Paul M. Hoff is here with us today and he's going to give more information on that part of the story that I don't have, you know, what the future plans are for the new high school and everything. As you can see in this slide, this is a, um, 
picture of his obituary showing that he um, died at the age of 89. So he, li- I feel like he lived a very long time for that particular age, you know, makes me hopeful that I have some longevity in my family. So uh, with that being said, uh, if you can go to the next slide, Dean. Okay, uh, Miss, I'm going to introduce Miss uh, Sandra Jamison. She is such a wonderful lady. I want her to give more history on Pleasant Litchford's role in the Second Baptist Church. Second Baptist Church is the oldest African-American church in the city, uh, founded, I think, in 1824. My grandfather, Pleasant Litchford, was a deacon there, and um, Miss Jamison can speak more on to him and uh, Catherine's roles in that area. So, Sandra? Good morning. <laughs> We're the oldest Black Baptist church in the city. Thank you. Uh, St. <laughs> Paul AME is the oldest. Uh, well, I'll read you some notes uh, I had for about Reverend Poindexter. It's been, you know, 201 years since he was born, but we're still talking about him because that's the kind of man that he was. He was born in 1819 in, in Virginia. And his father was a white journalist for the Richmond Enquirer, and an uncle had become a governor of Mississippi. His uh, mother was African and Cherokee descent. So his blend of cultures gave him the compassion for all people. And he also, because of his uh, Caucasian uh, DNA, he was allowed to vote. Uh, at the young age, he was given the apprentice job of learning to be a barber, which is an occupation he kept for the rest of his life. He and his wife Adelia came to Columbus, uh, Ohio in 1838, and he lived here almost 70 years before his death in 1907. Uh, He was baptized in uh, 1840 at the local AME church and was ordained as a church elder in uh, 1840. Uh, In 47, he served as the pastor of the anti-slavery Baptist church and that was until 1858. And uh, I think one of his uh, sons was also in the Civil War. But after the war, the members of of, uh, the Anti-Slavery Baptist Church and Second Baptist, we merged back together uh, and became, and and Reverend Poindexter at that point became the pastor and he was there for 40 years. His compassion and concern for all people led him to also serve in many other areas. He was a conductor of, of wagons on the Underground Railroad. He was president of the Pastors Union. Uh, he was part of the committee that was called the Local Visiting School Committee uh, to check on how things were going and the books they had and whatever. Uh, the school board, he was a school board member. He was a trustee for two other schools, including the College of Wilberforce. And uh, he formed the Sons of Protection for the Civil War of uh, uh, Soldiers. He was a public speaker, and because of that, he received many honorary degrees, and he also wrote for the Ohio State Journal newspaper. Uh, He was a committee member for the Republican National Convention. He basically was sort of self-taught for reading and writing. He had some education, but he also came into uh, uh, knowing an Englishman that was a tutor, and uh, his uh, barbershop was across the street from the state house. So that's how uh, he got many information things that he would overhear to help him with, with the uh, social justice things that he was a part of. Uh, I think there are a lot of other things that you might already know that he was part of the uh, uh, school system and uh, he was a trustee for the uh, school for the blind. He was on the city council, the state forestry bureau and uh, there, he was just a person that looked out for uh, everyone as far as the children. The, the uh, Catholic uh, school was not so good, and so he went to bat for them as well. As I say, his DNA, DNA was mixed. Uh, I have one more thing to share with you that I came across. Rita and I are, are members of the Franklin County Genealogical and Historical Society. Uh, we're part of the African American Interest Group. Uh, we normally meet the last Wednesday of every month at the main library. So we're anxious to get to do that again. And uh, we have a friend uh, in that group, uh, Nettie Ferguson. 
And uh, if you want to know anything about genealogy, she can help you find it. <laughs> so that's what our group is all about, helping one another. But uh, she sent me uh, some information. And when I read through it last night, I saw some very interesting things. Uh, she had uh, an account of Franklin County, free people of color and their settlements in 1850 to 1870. So when I read down the list for the different townships, uh, there was Blendon Township, Jackson Township, uh, Montgomery Township, and that has the names of Booker and Fields in it, and th they were members of Second Baptist. And then you drop down to Norwich and then to Perry Township, Upper Arlington, and guess whose name is there? Litchford. Uh, the Sharon Township, uh, and let's see, Turo Township, and the War Washington Township was Dublin, and that was uh, Butcher and Depp. And those are names that are, are in the history of the area. And another page, uh, there was a colored men's convention in 1849 and the delegates, uh, there was a central, uh, state central committee, uh, the North Star. And December 8, 1848, Franklin County delegates, James Preston Poindexter, James Booker, William Ward, W. Depp, and P. Litchford. And uh, at Ezekiel Fields, he became our very first minister. We came out of the First Baptist Church. Uh, they started in 1824, but by 1836, we became independent. In between that time, we were like a missionary church. And Ezekiel Fields was chosen to be our minister. And at that time, when we were, well, I guess you call this the 42nd General Assembly of the State of Ohio, uh, in uh, and they had several different churches that were incorporated. And for page 236, section 11, David Jenkins, George Butcher, Pleasant Litchford, Lewis Jenkins, N.B. Anderson and their associates uh, are hereby created a body politic and corporate by the name of the Second Baptist Church. So you can see that Litchford was right there at the beginning. And uh, those were the things I really wanted to let you know that was happening with uh, Pleasant Litchford and Reverend Poindexter. And we are uh, 185 years old today, or this year, sorry, for Second Baptist Church. Any questions? <laughs> Well, thank you, Miss uh, Sandra, for that information. It was very lovely for you to share. Um, next, I would like to introduce Miss Rita Smith, who will be sharing some information about the Litchford Hotel and Nancy Wilson. And I'm sure she has other good things to share as well. Rita? Good morning, commissioners. It was just a year ago that I was standing at the podium sharing uh, the story of Reverend Poindexter and our foundation. Um, I'm really here to share about, this is not Columbus history, it's Franklin County history and American history. And I am so pleased to be able to share my memories of uh, the Litchard family, but it comes from, a, I have to give you some other names that will, may, maybe you have heard of, and I don't know, but just in case. Uh, it was interesting. It, was about three or four years ago when Diane Runyon came to our genealogy group and uh, she wanted us to assist her with researching uh, about the Litchford family and what she had, uh, she ended up writing a book uh, called The Secret Under the, Parking, Under the Parking Lot. And I hope you've had a chance to see that. And when I started going back over my memories of, I realized that my associations of knowing the Litchford family was through the C.W. Bryant family. He, the C.W. Bryant were business persons. Uh, they were con uh, known as uh, very successful developers and builders and contractors. And, um, and C.W., even though I knew of C.W. Bryant, when I came along, and I'm not telling you my age, but when I came along, the C.W. Bryant family was the fam one of the families in the community, if you were looking at, at anything and related to construction. In fact, they helped to rebuild a temporary bridge 
over the, the river after the 1913 flood. So the C.W. Bryants were very successful. But again, all of these individuals that came here about that time, about the 19th or 1830s, that was the goods, the depths, and I'm sure you've heard about the Lucy Depp up around the zoo. Um, of course, Reverend Poindexter and Dr. White, they all st started out up around the Dublin area. And of course, Mr. Litchford came to the, uh, the undeveloped area that was to be known as Upper Arlington. Um, but, and, and as Sandra was sharing with you, um, because they, they all had interrelationships and, and they built their businesses around and they worked on those social justice issues. Um, in fact, John T. Ward, who was in Reynoldsburg was on the Underground Railroad. Um, Reverend Poindexter, remember I shared with you last year that he lived right down the street, right there at 41 North 4th Street. Um, and Re Mr. Bull, I don't know if you, Mr. Bull, who was there in Clintonville on High Street, then of course the Litchfords, then you would go on up to the depths to Dublin, to the Dublin area. All those people were working together on the Underground Railroad. So Franklin County has an extensive history in regards to the Underground Railroad. Um, but let me get back to the C.W. Bryants. I remember, and probably I went there not quite the right age, but I ended up at the Litchford Hotel, which you see there uh, in, uh, in your, um, on your PowerPoint. Litchford Hotel was at Gay and 4th Street. And um, I remember going and it had table, it was really fancy. It had tables with white folk, tablecloths and just really, really fancy, fancy. But when I came along again, I'm not telling my age, but that building has long gone. But when I came along, what uh, one of our major musicians, Nancy Wilson, she sang there at the uh, Litchford Hotel. And, and again, and the Litchford Hotel, by the way, is listed in the Green Book. Because remember a segregation, all of the entertainers and dignitaries that came to our city could only go to certain hotels. And so the Litchford was one of those. And it was built by William Litchford, the son of Pleasant. And, um, and then another play, I don't know if any of you remember, uh, Commissioner Boyce maybe remember Carl Sally. Carl Sally was from the Franklinton area but he ended up being an international saxophone player. He also, when I talked to him, he also has fond, fond memories of the Litchford Hotel and how they, all the big entertainers that would come there and they would be staying there and they played there and all of the great crowds. So Litchford was a very, again, it's like the Macon Hotel. We are losing all of our buildings that tell the story. And I and as I was sharing with some students the other day, history is really storytelling. And the Litchford Hotel is and the Macon Hotel and all the St. Clair Hotel are all institutions that were had great stories and and, and were found the foundation of our city. Um, I'm just excited. You know, every year, I guess I'll be, come back next year and talk about somebody else. But we have got such rich history here in, in Franklin County that talks about the contributions that, that Afro-Americans made. Because remember, I was saying the Bryant family were um, uh, contractors that, that was part of their heritage. And when I knew the Bryants, I didn't realize they were a part of the, the, the Litchford family. Um, but the David Jenkins who helped to build the state house, um, I'm sure worked with Mr. Litchford in regards to his trade as being a blacksmith. 
So I could ramble on, but I wanted you to just, just have an idea that this Litchford story is not an Upper Arlington story. It's not a Columbus story. It is Franklin County story because they were connected with, with so many of our early pioneers. And it's been a pleasure again to share with you a little bit of, of the information uh, about the Litchford and the C.W. Bryant family. Oh, Miss Rita, thank you so much. Listening to your stories always brings such joy. Um, to round us out, Paul M. Hoff, the superintendent of Upper Arlington Schools, will be joining us to talk about next steps, what's going to happen um, on the, as Miss Rita would say, the sacred ground of Upper Arlington. Paul. Well, great to be here this morning. I just want to begin by thanking uh, each each of the commissioners for your time this morning and thanking you for your service to our county. We truly appreciate it, especially during a pandemic. So just thanks for all you have done for all of us. Um, one of the things I try to make it a habit of never doing is going after Sandra and, and Rita because uh, they do such a great job of talking about all the history. So it's been great to work with them. And uh, it's been really an honor to get to know members of the of the Litchford family and I know Toy is with us today. I think Jim is with us as well. Um, this has been uh, quite a journey for us as a school district and as uh, a, a and, and as a community. Uh, the, the 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 entire community of Upper Arlington has really come together uh, to really embrace and honor this this history. And so, from a historical point of view, the reality is we've always taught Upper Arlington history within our schools, but we have learned through this experience that we weren't teaching our entire history. Uh, and Rita says that, great, this is all of our history and we need to teach all, all, all of that. And so we have updated uh, our, our, our curriculum and we are now teaching all of our history. And this Litchford history uh, is just amazing. As well, uh, many of you know that we're in the process of building a new high school that's gonna open in August and we're really excited about it. In the ground where this cemetery sits, uh, was actually going to be a part of the parking lot of the new high school. And our board uh, agrees with uh, Rita and Sandra and the family, this is sacred ground. Uh, and so our plans are being changed. And now the area that was gonna be a part of the parking lot is gonna be a permanent memorial to the Litchford family. It's gonna be a place uh, where, where there, will, there will be gardens, there will be signage. Uh, so we can make sure that this Litchford history is never again uh, for, for, for forgotten within Upper Arlington. And so we're excited about that and we're gonna be, uh, continue to work with the family and talk about how we can honor the Litchford family history uh, with, within our schools and within our community. So again, it's great to be with you this morning and it's great to be able to talk to you about the journey we're on together. All right, thank you so much, Paul, for sharing that with everyone. I just wanted to say one last thing. Thank you, commissioners, again, for having us. And I just wanted to share, I don't know if you could see, The Secrets Under the Parking Lot is a book that was published by two local authors that Rita had mentioned that discusses Pleasant Litchford, but also just Upper Arlington history and Franklin County history. So pick it up on Amazon if you're interested. I'm not getting paid for this, but I did want to mention it. This is a good idea to get started if you want to learn some good Franklin County, Ohio history. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Toya. I'm, I'm taking notes here. Secrets <laughs> Under the Parking Lot, that was called? Yeah, it's Secrets Under the Parking Lot, and I'll just bring okay. it into work for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I didn't even know where to start. I didn't even know where to start about how um, interesting and um, good that presentation was. Um, you get, you know, as an African American, I always get choked up when I um, am able to hear real history uh, of local people that are African Americans, and you you wonder, you know, we're all at some level are descendants of Africans who came from Africa or, or and perhaps were slaves. And, <clears throat> but most of us, that history is not attainable. 
You know, my, my grandmother passed away a couple of years ago and she was the heart and soul of our family. And she talked about the Litchford Hotel. Uh, I, I had many, many stories about um, when she came to Columbus and, um, and some of the experiences in places that I had never got to see as a child because they were gone already, you know, um, or, or they just, you know, in, in my um, later years where I can remember things, they, they just haven't existed. Uh, that, that being said, um, what an exciting story uh, this is. And I can remember when we were trying to track our history, there was a hard stop where we just ran into a wall and could not connect the dots and probably needed some professional help. We, we got to um, the, I want to say, um, early 19, I think we got back to about 1907 and tracking our history or something like that. And then we just couldn't get anywhere. Then my grandmother passed and we really lost those sort of little connecting points that only she would know, um, if you know what I mean. And, um, and so while we've gotten some of it and piecing it together, we're still trying. Uh, it's very difficult. And that's kind of the history of America. That's the history of of African slaves who came to America and how the history has been broken up. So this, what you've been able to capture is just a tremendous story. And I can't wait to learn more about it and read it and understand it. And what a great presentation this was um, today. I was going to correct you on the church then when you said yeah. Second Baptist was the first church. I was waiting. Yeah. And I think Sandra came in and, and, and corrected you a bit because uh, I'm a member of St. Paul. So we know St. Paul is the first like church. Now, one thing, last point I'll say, one thing I learned today, I love learning new things about history, particularly Black history in, in, in Central Ohio. But what I didn't know, I think it was Sandra that said um, Poindexter was baptized at an AME church in Columbus. So I assume that Poindexter was baptized at St. Paul. Is that? I, that? It wasn't written down in those words, but that's what I assumed also. Okay, yeah, because that, that's they were, if that's they were new. The first, there may have been others, but but I I have a feeling that that probably was the case. Yeah, yeah, that that's new information. That that was kind of surprising, and I'm not even sure St. Paul has that. I, I have to reach out to the historian there and 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 sort of see if we can reconcile that. But um, yeah. but thank you so much for the presentation. I I know my colleagues probably want to comment, so let me shut up and let them say something. I'll let, I'll let Commissioner Brown go first. I because I'd rather you know I I like history so much I I could we could forego the rest of the meeting and we could just sit <laughs> chat about this for the rest of the day for, as far as I'm concerned. The history is amazing, and you know I had no idea the area that is now Upper Arlington <laughs> was use the dog. Um, the history that is now Upper Arlington was the area in which there were. <laughs> was a cemetery for the black community. And there was so much going on in that area. And I, I, that is new to me. And, you know, I had no idea. So thank you for um, all that you brought to, um, to my knowledge of this community. Uh, you know, I thought I knew a lot, but you know, you always learn, and Toya, I always learn from you. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you to everybody who brought this presentation. I appreciate that, and the history is amazing. The, the, the young ladies that wrote the book, uh, Diane Runyon and Kim Starr. Kim Starr was a student at uh, Upper Arlington, and uh, she knew the area, but uh, her sideline is cleaning tombstones mm -hmm. and when she found out about the cemetery that's what got her started and she talked with diane and diane is a professional genealogist mm -hmm. so this is how, and she was a former uh, uh let's see sixth grade third grade teacher i've forgotten now but she was a teacher and so they were able to put the book together actually the picture that you saw the purple book there was a yellow one that came first so it's in a second edition and mm -hmm. uh, we're proud of them and we're proud of our genealogy group that was able to help them. And like I say, if we can get back to the third floor of the uh, main library downtown and also the uh, 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 Ohio Historical Connection, uh, they have a third floor. Uh, right. And those are places right here in town uh, that you can get it. You usually know that the uh, 
Mormons have a wonderful genealogy place, but mm -hmm. uh, Columbus is very good too. And the Fort Wade, Indiana uh, have, have very good sources. Uh, Reed and I, we always try to remind people to tell their own story. So if you don't know much about your own family, it's very interesting and it can be addictive. <laughs> But but it's very interesting. I, I grew up not knowing that I had a, a uncle that had been in the uh, Civil War, great, great uncle. And uh, Rita and I both uh, share a story that our some members of our family were married by Reverend Poindexter. And I didn't know that growing up either. So there, there are a lot of things that we can all catch up on that we didn't learn in school. You know, I always, <clears throat> I love history and I always love especially American history and, and, you know, love Franklin County history. I've been here for 56 of my nearly 57 years. And, and so learning more and more about uh, Franklin County and central Ohio history is great. It's always great stuff to, to learn. And I love, you know, I love, I'm always a little jealous of, it sounds a little odd, I guess, to say I'm jealous of, of, of American history, especially of um, African-American history. Um, but I'm, I'm a little bit jealous of it usually because my family history, you know, I, it only goes back so far in the United States because, you know, when, when I'm, you, you, when we start, when my family starts re researching our genealogy, we only go back a, a generation and then all of a sudden we jump to the other side of, uh, of the, of the, of the ocean. And, um, and so to hear, you know, uh, about, um, Pleasant Litchford and, and uh, Mr. Poindexter and, and, and have it go back so far in this community. It's, um, it's just fantastic stuff because, you know, my fam my family only goes back to the mid sixties in Franklin County and, and only goes back to the 1920s and, uh, and or the night just, just previous to the 1920s in the United States. And so I always get a little, uh, a little bit uh, now envious, uh, I guess, of, 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 uh, family history that goes back so much farther than my family history does in this, in this community and in this state. Um, but it's such rich history and such great, great story. I mean, to see Toya's family tree that, that goes back so far in this community is just uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, and, um, but then to, then to also see and understand and know the struggle that, that also is behind it is, uh, um, is, is very poignant and, 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 you know, and that, which is why it's, it's so great to celebrate it in this month of February, Black History Month. So um, really appreciate you guys uh, coming today and, and sharing all of this with us. Uh, just great stuff and, and um, learning more about all of it, in, in particular in Franklin County as well. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what else to say, but to say thank you. Um, probably one of the best presentations we've had in the um, now I'm in my fifth year here um, in, in all of the five black histories we had. This probably was the best presentation. So um, so thank you so much for coming today and I can't wait to get my book. I'm working on a book right now, so you can take your time, uh, get it to me because I got to finish the book that I'm reading right now because um, I'll start reading that and then I won't be, at, you know, I've got this thing where if I got to finish that book first. Well, this book is, it's a very easy read. Very easy. That's a pretty big compliment from Commissioner. <laughs> we've, we've had some pretty great presentations over the, over the years. Uh, oh, yeah. well, I, I this, just this be my favorite. Thank you for letting me share my family history with you guys. Um, I can come back and do it again because I'm actually related to the Depths as well by marriage. So I have a lot more to share. So whenever you want us to come back, we'll all be happy to do so. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, and and, uh, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, to um, Rita, Paul, Sandra, and Toya. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time out and all the work that you're doing to capture Franklin County's great and rich history. Thank we you so much. We will see you next year for sure. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, guys. Have a great meeting, and and be careful on the way home. Thank you, and everybody stay safe. Thank you. And I've had both my shots, so I'm doing good. Good for, you. Good for you. I don't have much of a trip to get home, so thanks for. <laughs> All right, we'll keep this agenda moving. So, is um, uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of February 16, 2021 general session, the February 18, 2021 briefing session, and the February 17, 2021 administrative briefing? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded voting, Commissioner O'Grady. Yes. 
Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Thank you. The minutes have been approved. Thank you. Uh, engineer? We begin with a public meeting or public hearing this morning, Commissioner. Great. I'd like to open up the public hearing for this <coughs> resolution. Is there anyone here in the audience who would like to speak? Uh, I'm sorry, I skipped, a, I skipped a session, didn't I? I always do that. I, I don't know what it is about the way this is lined up that makes me do that. It's 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 not my fault, it's your fault. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> How about if I start um, by reading the public hearing and then I'll let you go. Th that's better. Let's do it that way for that one. So here we go. Uh, we have a public hearing. Clerk, can you please read the public hearing notice? Thank you, Commissioner. Resolution regarding prayer of petition to vacate Armuth Avenue, Carroll Road, and two public alleys located in Mifflin Township, Franklin County, Ohio, granted. Okay, at this time, I'd like to open up the public hearing for this resolution. Is there anyone here in the audience on uh, this virtual meeting today that would like to speak to the public hearing? Uh, good morning, Commissioners. David Hodge here. I'm uh, here on behalf of the adjacent property owners, uh, several of whom submitted this petition for vacation. Uh, nothing to add, but uh, here to answer any questions if anybody has one. Thank you. Are there, uh, is there anyone else here to speak on behalf of this resolution? <clears throat> okay, seeing that there are none, I'd like to close the public hearing and have the clerk read the resolution into the record. Resolution number 133-21. Prayer petition to vacate Armuth Avenue, Carroll Road, and two public alleys located in Mifflin Township, Franklin County, Ohio, granted. Good morning, commissioners, staff members, and constituents. My name is Cornell Robertson, Franklin County Engineer and Franklin County Surveyor. Before I present on this resolution, I would like to thank Ms. Toya Williams and others for today's presentation. Very well done, and very informative. Thank you. Commissioners, this res resolution is for right-of-way vacation in the northeast part of Franklin County and Mifflin Township, southeast of Stelza Road and Agler Road intersection, again along Armuth <laughs> Avenue, along Carroll Road, and two public alleys. This resolution is the third in a series of three to vacate the right-of-way. A survey plat has been developed, reviewed, and signed by me, and is ready for your approval and signatures. If you choose to approve this resolution, we will route that survey plat to you through Clerk Hendon Lane. Mifflin Township is in support of the right-of-way vacation and we have not heard from anyone who may be against it. Pending any questions, I respectfully request your approval. If there are no questions, I'll move approval of resolution 133-21. Second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Grady? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Thank you. Resolution number 133-21 has been adopted. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Have a great day. You too. Domestic relations. Sure. Resolution number 134-21. Resolution authorizing a first amendment to the 2021 grant agreement with the Ohio Department of Youth Services in the amount of $40,000. Good morning, Commissioners. Barb Reeves, Deputy Director. This resolution is requesting two changes to our 2021 grant agreement. Uh, the first is to increase the budget by 40,000 to add training for staff on effective practices in community sup supervision. Additionally, we're uh, asking to realign funds within our competency attainment service program to add a treatment provider for any out of state services. Pending any questions, the court requests the approval of this resolution. There's no questions. I'll move approval of resolution 134-21. Second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Grady? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 134-21 has been adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Franklin County Data Center. Resolution number 135-21. Resolution authorizing the use of electronic signatures for all county agencies, offices, courts, and boards and adopting a policy setting forth appropriate safeguards and protocols. Good morning, Julie Lust representing the Franklin County Data Center. This resolution will expand authorization for electronic signatures throughout the county for the attached policy, which includes several layers of authorization requirements and security. DocuSign and ISO 27001 
and FedRAMP approved company has been chosen for distribution of the documents for electronic signature due to their expansive security protocols. And the data center security office has implemented several additional security protocols and requirements. Prior to electing to use or accept any e-signatures solutions, the agency, board, court, or office must document and submit a business case and risk assessment along with their electronic signature policy to the data center, the prosecuting attorney, the clerk to the board of commissioners, and the board of commissioners CIO for review and approval. This policy does not mandate electronic signatures, nor does it authorize any individual to sign on behalf of another individual, agency, or elected official in which they do not have signing authority. Pending any questions, the data center respectfully requests your approval of this resolution. I think we had a long, thorough discussion about this during briefing, and I just want to reiterate to the um, uh, guidelines and provisions that are in place to ensure that you know we're not skipping any parts of the process, um, you know, and that we're ensuring that the checks and balances that currently exist um, are also um, embedded in the electronic <coughs> signature process. And I know that was something that um, was we discussed a lot in briefing. I, I don't know if you want to just respond, or I've seen uh, Janine Hummer is also on here. If she may want to respond as well. Thank you, commissioners. Um, I just want to reiterate that um, we have spent um, a number of weeks as a team reviewing all aspects of this, um, and this is not something we have taken lightly. Um, we have um, thought through every step of the process to make sure your concerns regarding safety protocol are in place. Um, we have even went, we actually went beyond it, thinking about other scenarios. Um, and you will see through the legislation that is before you that, um, and the whereas clauses that we have carefully crafted that thought process um, addressing your concerns. So we are comfortable with moving into um, this new form of um, approvals. Uh, it is something, as you know, in your own business um, is the way of the future. And we think that it will help the county as a whole. Um, I often say that um, when we received a, you know, a, a mortgage or loan, we did everything by DocuSign or electronic. Uh, this is how we are moving. And um, I, it's, I'm very excited, as you can tell that we have this um, in place. Excellent. Well, if there are no further comments uh, or questions, then I will move approval of resolution 13521. Second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Grady? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 135-21 has been adopted. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Office of Aging. Resolution number 136-21. Resolution authorizing five grant agreements to provide outreach services for Franklin County senior options in the amount of $336,570. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Amy Funk, Assistant Director of Administration with the Office on Aging. Joining me this morning is Director Orvel Johns and our Grants Administrator, Nancy Mayo. The grant agencies in this outreach category target special population seniors in the community. These include the homebound, hard to reach, very low income seniors, Holocaust survivors, refugees, and immigrants, among others. The services are tailored to meet the specific needs of these particular populations, thereby assisting them to live as independently with an improved quality of life. These services are diverse and can include group special, I'm sorry, group socialization activities, peer support groups, translation services, and friendly visits. Pending any questions, I respectfully ask for your approval of this resolution. There's no questions. I'll move approval of resolution 13621. I'll second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Grady? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 136-21 has been adopted. 
Resolution number 137-21, resolution authorizing seven grant agreements to provide supportive services for Franklin County senior options in the amount of $760,962. Under this supportive services category, grant agencies provide services previously known under the Older Americans Act as community outreach. Specific services can include client finding, bill paying assistance, assessing uh, public benefits such as Medicaid and supplemental security income, and help with acquiring material assistance. Supportive services workers go to a client's home to provide these services, and these services are a valuable tool that enables seniors to continue living independently. Pending any questions, I respectfully request your approval of this resolution. There are no questions, I'll move approval of resolution 137-21. I'll second. Moved and second in voting. Commissioner Grady? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 137-21 has been adopted. Resolution number 138-21. Resolution authorizing 15 grant agreements to provide health promotion wellness services for Franklin County senior options in the amount of $1,479,337. Projects in this health promotion and wellness category focus on helping seniors improve or maintain their health status. These projects include, among other things, support for senior nursing clinics, cardiovascular improvement equipment for senior centers, assistance with obtaining needed prescription medications, and providing hearing evaluations and hearing aids. Pending any questions, I respectfully request your approval of this resolution. If there aren't any questions, I'll move pro approval of resolution 138-21. Second. Moved and second in voting. Commissioner O'Grady? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 138-21 has been adopted. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Committee partnerships. Resolution number 139-21. Resolution authorizing a one-year grant agreement with the Greater Columbus Arts Council in support of Franklin County artists, arts organizations, and cultural facilities in the amount of $4 million. Good morning, Commissioners. Dana McCrary, Administrator for Community Partnerships. This resolution provides $4 million in funding to support the Arts and Cultural Facilities Program Fund, which is facilitated by the Greater Columbus Arts Council on behalf of the Board of Commissioners. This fund supports artists and organizations of all sizes, uh, including organizations such as Glass Axis, the Urban Strings Columbus, Lincoln Theater, and the King Arts Complex. Joining us this morning are Tom Katzenmeyer, President and CEO of the Greater Columbus Arts Complex, excuse me, the Greater Columbus Arts Council, and Dante Wood Spikes, a local filmmaker and grant recipient. Tom? Dana, thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank uh, Commission President Boyce, Commissioners Brown, and O'Grady. I also want you to know that Dante and I very much appreciate being able to listen into the history lesson that we just heard. It was very meaningful uh, also to both of us. So I wanna start by saying thank you. I wanna also thank you for the three county appointments to the GCAC board, which just happened recently. Just to recap that quickly, uh, Leah Goldsmith, Jim Negron and Jamie Staley. We have already put them all to work and they are all participating. This is a, a working board. Leah is serving on the advocacy and marketing committee and she's also on the Creative Advancement Committee. She'll be reviewing individual artist grants, which is perfect assignment for her because she is a working artist. Jim Negron is on our executive committee and also serves on the Creative Advancement Committee. And he'll be reviewing the operating support grants, which are the large grants that we give out every year. And Jamie is on the festival committee and also on the Creative Advancement Committee. And she'll be reviewing the project support grants. So we put the new board members on the committee that reviews all the grant money, which you provide us. So it's a great way for them to get indoctrinated to 
our work. And again, they are all working and participating. Unfortunately, one of the first decisions they had to make with us was they had to vote to cancel the arts festival, which we've now had to do two years in a row because of COVID, but they were actively engaged in that debate and discussion. So uh, we're so grateful for the support that you've provided us through this difficult time. The county's investment last year was critical in sustaining the arts sector. And because of that support, the Arts Council not only survived 2020, but we were able to double down on our commitment to the community. And I will say this to you, we could not have done it without you. By any standard, 2020 was an unprecedented year. In January, we looked forward to a year that seemed ripe with possibility. In fact, 2019 was a record year um, for arts funding uh, in, in Columbus and Franklin County. But just eight weeks after the year started, we were on the precipice of a worldwide pandemic. And by June, we found ourselves in an incredible period of social and racial unrest not seen in decades. Most of our expectations for last year were tossed out the window, but your support remained constant. And while the bed tax and the admission fee receipts were far, far below what was expected, and they remain below what was expected, uh, they were a critical part of, we did get some money from them, they were a critical part of helping to navigate the challenges of last year and became even more so as we move into recovery this year. So I want to give you a, a moment of a few of the highlights of what we did with the public dollars last year and what we're looking forward to this year. So if many of you know, the creative workers were the hardest hit by the pandemic with an unemployment rate of more than 30%. The arts suffered more than even the hospitality sector. In March of last year, we responded quickly to this crisis by creating an emergency relief fund for artists to help with basic needs like rent, food, and medical bills. More than $328,000 was raised and it was used to support 428 artists. While much of this was individual and corporate donations, it was seeded with your public dollars. Recognizing the severe financial crunch facing our cultural organizations, our awards to the 25 operating support grantees actually increased slightly over 2019 to $5.6 million. While project support applications declined due to cancellation of events, we were still able to award 44 grants for a total of nearly $550,000. We also awarded the first grants in one of our newest programs. It's called Thrive. We're very proud of this. This is a three-year program that provides unrestricted dollars to address disparities in inequitable funding in the arts and the impact of this inequity on arts and cultural organizations led by and serving people of color. All People Arts, Maroon Arts Group, and State of the Arts Productions each received this grant. In June, we launched the Arts Unite CBUS project with CAPA. I know you're all familiar with that. It came when the protests began after the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. We paid artists to create messages of love, healing, and unity and presented cash awards to black filmmakers and photographers for their documentation of the protests in Columbus. You're about to hear from one of those artists. In the fall, the Arts Council expanded this work and began a partnership with the Maroon Arts Group and the City of Columbus on a project called Deliver Black Dreams. It's a new and aspirational racial equity campaign designed by Marshall Shorts. You're gonna hear a lot more about that project as 2021 unfolds. We also joined the Can't Stop CBUS initiative, the community-wide volunteer effort that provided solutions to numerous sectors during the pandemic. The partnership resulted in the deeply impactful curbside concerts. I know you saw the coverage of that. The Gravity, Gravity Uplift murals and the launch of Artbox, a new app to help people explore public art in Columbus. And during all that I just mentioned, we also threw a few virtual events in, finished our strategic plan, one that uh, incorporates work on diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout. And we moved into our new home at 182 East Long Street, a historic space that provides much improved accessibility to the community, as well as a gallery that presents work 
by marginalized community communities. Franklin County's investment remains part of the game-changing strategy for the arts in Columbus. And for the next year, we know that game is recovery and stabilization. But I was inspired by the recent letter in the dispatch from Dr. Melanie Korn, the president of CCAD, where she asked us to envision how we can all contribute to a cultural renaissance like the one that actually happened after the 1918 pandemic. I can promise you that while we invest in recovery, we will also strive to answer her charge to inspire the community and manifest the vision of a thriving Columbus where the arts matter to all of us. So before I go, I wanna say thanks once again on behalf of the board and staff of the Greater Columbus Arts Council and the entire arts community. We thank you for your investment uh, in the arts. I wanna turn it over to our guest today, uh, Dante Woods, Spikes, a talented filmmaker who is one of the recipients of our Art Unite CBUS Film and Photography Awards for his film, which is entitled As a Matter of Black. It's a documentary that displays how some of Columbus's most known artists and activists work to spread awareness and healing in response to the protests and injustices. This film was shown at the Gateway Film Center as part of the Sundance Film Festival uh, that we uh, showcased locally here. Uh, so he got some great national visibility on this project. He's also one of our campaign artists and uh, we love him dearly and I think that you will too. With that, I'll turn it over to Dante. Well, th thank you so much for the introduction and uh, speaking on behalf of me in such a positive way, I appreciate that. And I also would like to say thank, thank you for the history uh, that the previous group was talking about. Um, as a person that has done professional development and been a part of their critically acclaimed Idea Day that they started in Upper Arlington to address racial inequalities and inequities, I can vouch that they are doing things to address the Black history in Franklin County and Upper Arlington. And I don't know if Mr. Imoff is still on, but I think me and him have a lot to discuss. Um, and I think it's ironic that we're talking about black history and whatnot, because it all ties into the theme that I want to talk about. Um, when we when we talk about black history, we also have to talk about what's going on right now. And we have to make sure kids have an opportunity to tie themselves in with the history as a child. I remember everyone always saying Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther King Jr., which was a great person to look at and see what they accomplished but I just couldn't make any ties or connections to him and I'm wondering why people are saying you know you're like him you're a young black man you can do anything but no one really gave me an opportunity or a chance to show who I was or to give me an opportunity to know myself and it took a while for me to get there but I made it there and let me tell you how I made it there so one of the artists in Columbus, Ohio, his name is Richard Duart Brown. And I ended up meeting him at Central Community House where I started to work at. And Central Community House is a fiscal sponsor for the group called Transit Arts, where they give uh, children of all walks of life an opportunity to express themselves artistically, whether it be um, poetry, dance, rap, uh, painting, drawing. They embrace all children, children that come from troubled environments, children that are talented. Whoever you can think of, if they're a child and they have a talent, they're at Transit Arts. Um, I had met Duarte there. And one day out of the blue, he just said, Dante, I have to paint you. I'm like, paint me? I, I didn't do anything. Why do you, what you want to paint me for? I haven't done anything to be in a painting. And he shared with me, he said, you know, Dante, I, I just paint people when I see them. And he explained to me the way I work with the children, the stuff that I was doing in the community and the way I spoke, the way I engaged, that was enough for him to believe that it was time to paint me. And when he had painted me, it was in, it was featured in an art show called Forceful Perceptions at the King Arts Complex, which was uh, put together by David Michael, who's also another artist that has done a lot with Greater Columbus Arts Council. 
And that was my first time being introduced to the whole artist community. And as I'm looking at all of these other people and I'm looking at this painting of myself, I'm like, whoa, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be here. <laughs> you know, I, I haven't done much or done anything. After that, I thought it was over with. I didn't think too much of it. But later on, I get a call from Duarte. Um, and he's like screaming at the top of his lungs. He's like, Dante, Dante, we're going to be a part of the, the gallery of echoes and I'm using your painting. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. So Gallery of Echoes, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with that, but it was a production put on by Shadowbox Live. And what they did was they took different pieces of art and they turned them into musicals and they made music composition to it. So when once I found this out, I was like, OK, I think this might be it right here because I don't have anything else I can do to pay you back or honor what you're doing for me. <laughs> But when I got there, I met a guy named Steve Geyer. He was in charge of um, Shadowbox Live, and he's the one that had the vision and put it all together. And as we're there, he's actually behind the camera recording the paintings. He was the light guy. Uh, he was getting some of the food and serving people. And he also was the person in charge. Usually the person in charge doesn't do those things, but he did all of it. And when I had saw that, I something sparked in my head and said, you know what, I really don't have to wait. If this guy is in charge of everything and he still believes what he created, he still has to invest in. I think I have to take a little bit of that and apply it to my own life, but I still really don't know what to do. Um, after that, I knew I, I had ideas and visions, but I had nothing. And that's when Duarte has said, Dante, um, Greater Columbus Arts Council gives grants to artists. And I'll be 100% honest with you, I come from an environment where no one talks about art. No one does art. No one in my family was an artist. So I didn't know what a grant really was. And I'm thinking if I got any type of money, don't I have to pay it back? And <laughs> isn't it going to build up into my collections and my credit or whatnot? But he said, no, Dante, all you have to do is apply, let them know what you're doing and, and show them what it is you create. So fast forward, I started uh, applying for grants a couple of years back. And up to this day, I still apply for those grants. And just here recently, I was able to create the documentary titled As a Matter of Black, which happens to be my biggest accomplishment as a videographer so far. And what's interesting about it is I never really envisioned it happening the way it happened, but it did. And I owe a lot of that to the people at GCAC that saw what I was doing and gave me an opportunity to showcase my skill set. Because once again, I come from an environment where that was just something that no one talked about. So I'm able to invest in a skill that I found later in my life. And it's taken me to places I never imagined I would make it to. So, you know, with that being said, um, you know, the history of art in Columbus, Ohio, and all of the artists that are here, all the organizations, as I'm being exposed to it more, I'm recognizing that when you have those strong ties and you have organizations that back the community the proper way, you really can't go wrong with the arts and when you make an investment in it. And I can talk all day, but I think I made my point. <laughs> yes, um, final thing, final thing I'd like to say once again with the, the, the Black History coming back to being you know Black History Month as of right now, I have an opportunity to look at myself and say, I'm creating history. 2020 was one of the most difficult years known to the existence of the human race, but it was one of the best years I ever had because I, I created that documentary in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle of political discourse, in the middle of uh, racial inequalities. And I was able to bring it all back together and give my community something that they can look at and be proud of. So um, I just want to say, you know, thank you for that. GCAC and thank you for listening to me and share my story. Dante, thank you very much. And obviously we'd be 
delighted to take questions from the commissioners. I wanted to let you know that those three films, including Dante's, will be on our website at some point soon. So we'll email the commissioners and your staffs. You must watch them. They are short films and there are interviews with each of the filmmakers attached to them and they are incredibly moving and they're about a part of the history of Columbus, which we've been talking about in Franklin County today, really documenting that period of time this past summer. I also want to thank Ken Wilson, uh, Dana McCrary, who's just delightful and tremendous. You all know that. I'm telling you something you already know. And Eric Janis for his help on the appointments uh, that you made to our board. So thank you all very much. Dante, I think your story tells why we invest in the arts. Um, your story is the perfect example of the reason that we need to invest in the arts the way we do. I know Duarte and I know how persuasive he can be, but if you're coming from a community or a family that doesn't talk about arts, you need that outside support that you got from Central Community House and you need the artists around you that you found or you need a teacher or you need somebody that's going to give you that. And the arts community and Greater Columbus Arts Council and others I mean, it's about jobs, it's about economic development, and it's about the creative energy of our community. So it's all of those things that you just talked about is the reason that we invest in, in this way for arts and culture. So thank you. And Tom, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you both for uh, sharing uh, and, and all that you do for Central Ohio and uh, our economy. Dante, I can't wait to meet you in person. Looking forward to connecting at some point, maybe when the pandemic slows down. Thank you. Um, I, I actually think we met in person a long time ago when I graduated. I think you gave a speech, but I would love to meet you again, sir. OK, I'll look, I'll look forward to it. We'll make, <laughs> yes. we'll make a point of it. We'll make all a point right. of it. Tom, Dante, we, we believe in... Um, arts uh, as a uh, economic development driver. Uh, we've, we've, made these, we've made these commitments, we've made these investments in the arts over the years, uh, but in particular over the last two years because of our belief that, that uh, the arts are a major driver of economic development in this community. But uh, Commissioner Brown is absolutely 100% correct when she says that that uh, the investment in, in artists like you, Dante, are also the, uh, the other driver uh, behind, behind what we do and why we do it. And uh, it, the impact that it has on, on, on folks like you uh, is, uh, is, is something that uh, we can't, you know, we, it, 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 we can't deny it and we, we believe in. Uh, so, um, you know, it's so we appreciate you being here today to tell your story. It's uh, it's impactful. Commissioners, thank, you what a, thank you all for being here. It's such a it's such a thrill to see uh, the commissioners' funding for the arts to see it really come to life through uh, Dante, and we're so excited to see what you're doing now and to see what you're going to be doing in the future because your future looks incredibly bright. So thank you for, thank you for being here with us this morning. And <coughs> commissioners, if there are no other questions, I would respectfully request the approval of this resolution. There's no questions. I'll move approval of resolution 139-21. Commissioner I Brown. think she's put out second. Oh, did she freeze up? It looks Thanks. like she froze up. Uh, I'll second, Dean. Thank you, Commissioner. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Grady? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 139 21 has been adopted. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. All. Thank you.
Next, Justice Policy and Programs. Resolution number 140-21, resolution authorizing a subgrant award and contract for service with YMCA of Central Ohio for juvenile justice and delinquency prevention programming under the fiscal year 2019 Title II Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act block grant in the amount of $35,000. Good morning, Commissioners. Courtney Benner with the Office of Justice Policy and Programs. Our resolution this morning requests your approval of a subgrant award and contract for service with YMCA of Central Ohio for juvenile justice and delinquency prevention programming under our 2019 Title II grant in the amount of $35,000. YMCA's Fresh Start program will serve as an, an alternative to incarceration for youth that have had previous contact with the juvenile justice system or those who are identified as being at risk for future involvement. Programming will serve up to 40 youth between the ages of 13 and 17 in Franklin County and will incorporate a variety of best practices, including individual and group counseling, mentoring, AOD education, violence prevention and victim awareness education, academic support, social emotional learning and family empowerment groups. Pending any questions, I respectfully request your approval of this resolution. If there's no questions, I'll move approval of resolution 14021. Second. Moved and seconded voting, Commissioner Grady? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 140 21 has been adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Purchasing. Resolution number 141 21. Resolution approving purchases for various Franklin County agencies in the amount of six million one hundred excuse me, one hundred and thirty eight thousand four hundred and five dollars and thirty two cents. Good morning, Commissioners. Megan Perry Ballonier, Director of Purchasing. This resolution requests your approval of 113 purchase orders for which the county auditor has pre-certified available funding. This week, 12 out of 18 POs, totaling $84,760, are being presented for award to six women business enterprises, one minority business enterprise, four small and emerging business enterprises, and one disadvantaged business enterprise. This represents 63% of the eligible PO volume and 87% of the eligible PO dollar value. Pending any questions, I request your approval of this resolution. There's no uh, questions. I will move approval of resolution 141-21. Second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner O'Grady? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 141-21 has been I think uh, I think Commissioner Brown is on uh, um, being now. I back. see her. I'm back. Thank you. <laughs> uh, next Board of Commissioners. Resolution number 142-21. A resolution approving the issuance of bonds by the Columbus Franklin County Finance Authority for the Groveport Community <laughs> School Project. Ms. Huddle, it looks like you're still muted. Thank you. Good morning. Patty Huddle with the uh, Columbus Franklin County Finance Authority. Um, as we have done in the past, the Finance Authority was asked by the county to perform a Tax Equity Fiscal Responsibility Act, or TEFRA, review of the proposed tax-exempt bond issuance for two 501c3 charter schools, Sullivan Avenue and Groveport Community Schools. The bond proceeds, 18.5 million for Groveport and 9.5 million for Sullivan Avenue will be used to purchase and renovate their existing buildings. Bond counsel for this transaction, Ben Keto with Ice Miller is also present here today. The TEFRA review encompasses a review of first, the issuances qualifications for tax exempt eligibility as a public purpose under the Ohio revised code. We had outside counsel, Greg Daniels with Squire Patton Boggs, review the public purpose as to Ohio law, which was confirmed. The second review is of the market response to the credit without a full financial review. This is achieved by determining if the project has procured one of three items. In this case, we found the project had accomplished two of the three items meeting the test for financial viability. The first is the bond placement with a nationally recognized banking firm, Loop Capital Markets. And the second, the procurement of an investor letter from RM Charter. 
With these findings, we believe the projects have met the test, TEFRA test to qualify for tax exempt bonds. And we're pleased to perform a TEFRA review for the county. Ben and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Other questions, I'll move approval of resolution 142-21. Second. Moved and seconded voting, Commissioner Grady. Yes. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Boyce. Yes. Resolution number 142-21 has been adopted. Resolution number 143-21, a resolution approving the issuance of bonds by the Columbus Franklin County Finance Authority for the Sullivan Ave Avenue Community School Project. And commissioners, I would provide the same overview that um, I summarized previously. And if there's no further questions, I uh, move uh, of resolution 143-21. Second. Moved and seconded voting, Commissioner Grady? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 143-21 has been adopted. Resolution number 144-21, resolution appointing members to the Franklin County Community Corrections Planning Board. Good morning, Commissioners Eric Janis, Deputy Administrator. Uh, Commissioners, this resolution is the annual resolution making appointments to the Community Corrections Planning Board. Uh, pending any questions, would recommend approval. If there's no questions, I'll move approval of resolution 144-21. Second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner O'Grady? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Thank you. Resolution number 144-21 has been adopted. It concludes our regular agenda. Are there any generalizations? No, Commissioner. Well, that will conclude our meeting. Is, uh, is there anyone from the media that has any questions? Okay, seeing that there are none, that concludes our meeting. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.